First Peter is where we are. We'll pick back up where we left off. And in First Peter chapter 1, in this growing up that we're talking about now, in chapter 1, he was calling for believers, forget about the struggles Because you are dealing with struggles, but you know what? Let's focus on your salvation instead. And so that was the story of salvation, chapter one. Then in chapter two, we start now this growing up process. Take that next step in your faith and grow up. Well, how? Well, the first thing we saw in verses one through three, love God's word. Long for the pureness of God's word. And in that, remember we made the challenge then, because you know what I'm going to preach. I'm going to pick up where we left off, and I'm going to preach the next few verses and then pick up where we left off the next week. We said then, why don't you send me some outlines? Why don't you study and be prepared before you come rather than show up and say, oh, I'm an empty vessel. Pour into me. You've got the same Bible I've got. So look at it. Be ready and come prepared. And so people started sending me some outlines they had, which is great. Well, I got another one this week. And I want to share the outline with you. I I didn't do this before, but I'm just going to give her sermon points. Uh, Eva Jordan uh, just graduated from high school. She looked at this text, and then she sent me an email saying, here's how I think you might preach the text. Here's how I think it could be broken down. It's awesome. She even sent a sermon title. Her sermon title was A Standard of Obedience. And what we're going to look at today, verses 13 through 17. A Standard of Obedience. Her first point was obedience to a standard. And there are standards out there, and God's called for us to be obedient. And and then she explained a little bit. It was great. Her second point, obedience sets a standard. And and again, she's dead on right. That is right. And you'll you'll see it in the text here in a little bit. And then the last point, which by the way, you know how it warms my heart that she sent a three-point sermon. Because, you know, I'm a Trinitarian preacher. I think there have got to be three points in every sermon. And she three points. Obedience to the standard. And then she explained that. Just awesome. So love this word. Long for the word. Desire it. Learn from it. That was the first thing. The second thing then is to build a community of believers. We saw that in in, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. Christ is the cornerstone. He's a living stone, and we, because we've been rescued by Christ, are living stones built on the cornerstone that creates this solid community of faith and a solid community of believers. You know, and in that section, and I'll get to what we're going to preach today in just a second, but in that section, there was something that really stuck out. These are Gentiles, right? So they're familiar with the Roman culture and the Grecian culture. But they, by faith, have trusted Christ. And in, 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 in many areas there, that seemed, well, that was, that's just a Jewish practice. Well, Christ came and did what the gospel always supposed to do, what faith always supposed to do, expand it to everybody. It's not just for the Jews. Starts with the Jews, goes to everybody. And, and, and then in that, now these people are grafted in. How could Gentiles ever be a part? Well, by the way, we, we would have been Gentiles then too. How could Gentiles be a part? Well, not only does Peter say you are, which is quite an advancement in Peter's own personal faith. Not only does he say that, but then he says, I'm going to use a bunch of scripture and show you what God thinks of you. I'm just going to read this to you again real quick. We touched on this last week. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. He says to these people who now feel like we don't belong anywhere. We're, we're, we're Roman or Grecian, but now we don't fit in that culture because we say we're Christian. But here's what God says, that you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once, you weren't even a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You may be rejected by people, but not by God. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You now are the holy nation, the Old Testament passages we're speaking forward to. That had to be a rallying cry for them, right? Because now they've got a home. They've got a body of believers that's growing. 
And now they're, they're now associating. They've got the, the most important thing in common. For all the things they didn't have in common, and there were lots of things they didn't have in common, the most important thing now they have in common, and that is Christ. We're aliens. Our, our citizenship eternally is in heaven. We are we're on the earth. We're not of it. We are, we are in the world. We're not of the world. We're royal priesthood. We're a chosen race. This is what God thinks about us. And that must have felt really good to say. And by the way, it's true today for you and me too that this is not our eternal, our eternal citizenship is not here. Our eternal citizenship is in heaven. And we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And we, even we, we're a chosen race by God. Royal priesthood of God's own possession. It was true then, it's true now. So how do we live in this current situation? Here's what we've learned so far. Long for God's word, build the Christian community, live in an excellent way, give glory to God and proclaim Christ. That sounds good. That sounds good. Here's the people who've been suffering. They've been persecuted. They've been beaten down. But now they're feeling pretty good. Yeah, we don't belong here. Our God's greater. And then you get to verse 13. Then you get to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, and it must have to them felt like someone slammed on the brakes. What? Well, let's read it. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Let's stand and honor the reading of God's word. While you're doing that, I want to show you some pictures from the chapel today. Man, we have had a good day. Today's been a good day. Amen. In the chapel this morning, that we, I, I preach it at 8 o'clock in the chapel, and there are about 40 people that come, and we play a piano, we sing hymns. It's great. And then we come in and we do this twice. But we've never had a baby dedication in the chapel. Well, today, we had a baby dedication in the chapel. And a great story. That is Granger Lloyd Dimitruk. And what a cool last name, by the way. His parents, Corin and Bryce, he was in the hospital for over 100 days. Maybe 150 days might have been, maybe even more. He had, an, pardon me if I get this wrong, unphalacea. Familiar with that? The intestines are born, he's born with his intestines outside. Internal organs are outside. And because of remarkable advancements in medicine, they're able to put it back. And again, 100 plus days in the hospital. After his first surgery, they thought he was going to die. But look at it. Praise be to God. Amen. Praise be to God. I'm going to talk a little bit in just a second about what they said when they had the opportunity to give testimony to the chapel. But first, let's read the text. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13. You're a royal priesthood. Doesn't matter what people think about you. You're a chosen race. Verse 13, submit. What? Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, but do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. Use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth and our time together to look at your word and learn from it. I pray that we would. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Submit the chosen race, the royal priesthood. We're after God's own possession. Submit. That's maybe not where they saw that conversation going. As they're reading this letter, that might have seemed like it might have been a little out of place. 
shocking opening statement after something like that. But here's what I want you to see in the text today. Here's what I want you to see. Here's what we're going to look at today. Growing up includes giving up. Growing up includes giving up. Well, that doesn't make sense, preacher. Why do we advance the faith by submitting? That seems weak. Well, as you give up your will for his will, this is going to start to make a lot more sense. Here's the first thing I want you to see in the text. Submission to authority. By the way, submission is a word that carries a connotation that is uh, maybe even controversial or it just it's contentious. Maybe the best example of that, you're just a couple pages away from maybe the best example of that, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Jump there real quick. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to get there in a couple weeks and preach it. You're going to love it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Look what it says. You there? Yup. <laughs> I'm going to preach that from the pulpit. Wives, be submissive to your own husband. Hey, man. Some of you are saying, preach it now, preach it now, preach it now. No, you got to wait a couple weeks. Got to wait a couple weeks. He's like, go for it, do it. No, we're not going to, but it's coming up. So that idea of submission, people think, oh, it means weakness. It means what? Man, wait, wait till you hear, wait till you hear the sermon. It, I can't wait to preach it. It's going to be good. This is great. This one's great, but I can't, I, that's going to be fun to preach. So what does it mean in context? Here's what submission means in context. To become inclined or willing to submit to orders. Orders, it's a military term. It's the, the commander says get in your place and they get in the place. So it could be that. Willing to submit or the wishes of others. It's a willingness for that. A, a desire for that. A, a desire to be a part of that group and to follow along and, and willingly submit to this overall good idea. Who's Peter telling them to submit to? Well, keep reading the text. Every human institution, kings, governors, all of them, every, that word every in the Greek, I love when people say that, in the Greek, translates to mean Every. That word human in the Greek translates to human. Every human institution. Now, the word institution is unique because the language used for that word institution shows with it and carries with it this idea that it's something God created. Wait a second. I'm supposed to submit to every human thing that God made? Humans are fallen. Humans are sinful. How does this work together? Maybe Romans chapter 13 would help out. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Every person, every person, is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Why do we submit to the rules of government? Why do we submit to every human authority? Because every human authority is underneath God. But what happens when the rules are bad? God is good. What happens when I don't agree with those in authority? I agree with God. And God has told me to submit to every one of them. People are sinful, they're fallen, they make mistakes, and yet God is in control. But you know, the government gets stuff wrong. Government's corrupt. The government's whatever you might, you can add whatever you want to add to that. Why would I submit to that? What am I supposed to do? Pay your taxes, not break the law. I heard a preacher say this. It was good, really good. Talking about paying your taxes. I don't know if anyone loves, I'm, anyone here, show of hands, say, I can't wait to pay more taxes. Anyone? <laughs> no? You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So let me pay your taxes. Right? Now, of course, of course, Jesus is so much better than us. After he tells them to pay their taxes, he pulls a fish out of the water, opens a fish mouth, and the tax money is in there. Well, that doesn't work for us. We can't do that. 
But he does, doesn't keep it, just gives it all. Give to Caesar, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Here, here's, here's the issue that we have. Here, here's the issue. Yes, governments are, they struggle all around the world. Struggle, bad things, bad things are done. Bad, 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 bad. But the opportunity we have as Christians is to come in recognizing that God is in ultimate control. And as people suffer and struggle and lack joy and lack hope and lack opportunity and act promise, the Christians are supposed to come in and say, here's joy, here's hope, here's opportunity, here's promise. We're in a brotherhood. We work together. We, we serve together and we love Jesus. And there's hope in Jesus. There's help in Jesus. There's life in Jesus. There's joy in Jesus. But we, don't, we, we end up not doing that. What we end up doing is we pick a team in the whole political thing. And we pick a team. And then we excuse our team even when they do things that are not morally lining up with God. Because we want our team to win. And so we say, okay, well, I, well they did. Well, I don't know. But this is my team. I got to tell you something, I've been around a long time. Maybe you've heard, I'm 54 years old. In my voting lifetime, guess what? Both, there are two major political parties. Both have a shared power for, again, since I've been voting like the same amount of time. Same amount of time. How they doing? How they doing? Going good? They getting along with each other pretty good? Been going good? And yet you think that maybe your team, if they have the power, you have the power. My brothers and sisters, you've all lived long enough. They've all had their share of power. You know what they want? They want more power. You know what my team is? My team, <laughs> goodness, Steve. <laughs> Steven. Okay, now, Stephen, in the last service you participated, audience participation was good, and I approved it, but no more audience participation from you, all right? <laughs> I said, you know who my team is? He said, Ohio State. Well, yes, but... I mean, I'm, I'm on Team Jesus, because he doesn't need my vote to be king. He doesn't need... He's, I'm on Team Jesus. He doesn't have term limits. He doesn't age out of anything. He doesn't make mistakes. I'm on team Jesus because he will always be king. He's not holding the throne for somebody. He's always the king. And I'm on his team. And being on his team means that I will submit to every human institution. Ooh, well, how do you do that? Second point, submission of will. Verse 13 said, we submit for the Lord's sake. Well, if that isn't enough, look at verse 15. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And that last part of that verse really blesses my heart. Nothing more than to see an idiot have to be quiet. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe I enjoy it too much. Here's the will of God. How do you silence the ignorance of foolish men? Do right. That's a pretty powerful thing. This is the will of God. How many times have you heard people say, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what God wants for my life. I don't know. I don't know what God wants. What is God's will for my life? Well, three times in the Bible it says, here's God's will. Think you ought to know him? Well, let's look at him. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, the Bible says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. What does that mean? You're growing in Christ. What does that mean? Dying every day to self and growing closer to Christ every day. My team is Jesus. I want him to win because when he wins in people's lives, they by faith come to Christ. And then as they come to Christ, they grow in the faith through the sanctification process. It builds a better body of believers because we're not fighting about secondary things. We're fighting for the gospel together. Your sanctification is the will of God. And then interestingly, it goes on to add this, to abstain then from sexual immorality. You might say, oh, immorality, sexual immorality is, is worse now than it's ever been. Well, that's not true. It's as bad now as it's ever been and it will always be. 
Oh, some of the stories from the time when Peter was writing this letter. Oh, some of the stories from Nero, things that he was doing. The will of God in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything, give thanks. Bryce and Corn with their child in the chapel, we got to, they got to stand up and give testimony of their, of their experience. You know what they both did? They gave thanks for what God had done. You can't, I can't imagine how hard that would be to see your baby there and after the first surgery not know if the baby's going to survive, what, what's going to happen, how this is going to work out. And yet they stood up in front of the chapel and, and they really did this throughout the whole process, not just today. They gave thanks for God's goodness and his faithfulness and his love and his care and his protection. The will of God is that in everything you would give thanks. And we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, in, here's God's will, do right. Do right, be right with the holy God, which means righteousness. Be right with God because that will silence the ignorance of foolish men. Here's what I'm saying. If you break laws to protest laws you don't like, now you're the foolish one. If you decide, here's what we're going to do. I'm so mad. I'm so mad at the government. I'm going to go break laws now and have the police have to come out and, and deal with me. But I'll show them. Here's what you showed them. You showed them your ignorance. You're supposed to be the Christian because it feeds into the narrative against Christians. Oh, you're a Christian and you did that? Oh, that's what a Christian would do? No, I'm not saying that there, there aren't times to go out and, and stand and pray, make yourself known and seen. But when you break laws because you're mad at the system that's set up, you then have done something that shows you are an You are an anathema to what Christ would have you do. You don't show your holiness by breaking the law. It's like you're driving your car, you get caught speeding. Guy comes up to you, officer comes up to you, you know, you're speeding. Hey, what are you doing pulling me over? I'm a royal priesthood, man. I'm a a chosen race. I'm not, look, man, I'm not, I, I am in this world. I'm not of this world. My authority is higher than you. I don't have to listen to you. Drive as fast as I want to drive. Here's, let me, those are things not to say. Those are things not to say. You're giving a narrative that's anti-Christian and suddenly we are the ignorance, want, ignorant ones. The best way to silence the ignorance of foolish men, do good. Do good. Okay, let's back up a little bit to COVID. Remember COVID? So COVID happens, we have to shut the church down for a year. Now, we did. I, I even did a video, read Romans chapter 13, about, look, we understand God is ultimately in control. This is what the government's asking us to do. We'll do it. We did it. We can still communicate through online. We are communicating right now through online. YouTube, by the way, has overtaken Facebook for us as viewership because people have it on their smart TVs and they can watch it home. That's great. It's like having a TV station we didn't have to do anything for. It's awesome. And, but when we had to be out, we were out. And we came back and then COVID flared up again. We took off a little bit, took a break. Some people were mad that we, maybe you have church anyway. You'll show the government have church anyway. What does that, what does that show? So they're going to come and have to do something to us. What are we going to do? Lay in our seats, make them drag us out of here. That would be the Christian thing to do? No. And guess what we did? You know what we did do during COVID? You know what we did do? Here's what we did do. Here's what you did do during COVID. Up until that point in the history of our ministry, it was the largest giving year ever, and you weren't here because you loved the church. You were faithful with your giving, and you also knew what we were doing with it. We fed the entire hospital. How can you have a relationship? If you don't live in Monroe, go to your local hospital and say, hey, we want to feed your hospital. You're not allowed to do that. You can't health department stuff or whatever. You can't do that. We feed the entire hospital. We did during COVID. We have since COVID. We planted a church during COVID in a community that needed help. And so we went to that community, planted a church in a church building there, and we had people lined up. We worked with Heart for Monroe. People lined up in that area, lined up around the block in their car. They'd drive up. We'd give them stuff, give them supplies, give them toilet paper, give them money, give them clothing, whatever was needed. And then at the end of the line, then we would meet with them and pray with them and take their prayer requests down. That church didn't even have a congregation. Uh, Iglesia Antioquia was just getting started. didn't even have a congregation formed. And the pastor was there in a church he couldn't preach in in front of people who couldn't be there, yet he was ministering to the community. Now the church is alive and well and still ministering to the community. What do you do? I don't understand why they would want me to do this. Here's what you do understand. What God says, here's his will, do good. That's the best way to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
Not being ignorant with them, that doesn't do it. Well, that leads to the third thing. We'll be finished. Submission in reverence. But wait a second, aren't we free though? We are free, right? Yes, we are. What are we free to do? Look, keep reading in verse 16. We are free to be bond slaves of God. That means our lives, our actions, our purpose, all of it determined by God. And we feel really free in that. Because we've lived apart from God and living with God is way better. Then in verse 17, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. Is, it, is all that possible? It's all possible because of the fear God part. How can we honor all people? Some aren't honorable. Well, the Bible says humanity is created in the image of God. The Bible says because of sin, we have marred that image-bearing status that we have. And the Bible says that Christ comes to renew what God made us to be. Guess what? You sinned too. So you, as an image bearer of God, marred that image. Christ renewed that in you. And now you can honor all people as image bearers of God who could also be renewed by Christ. Honor all people? Yes. Why? Because we have reverence for God. God rescued us. He can rescue them too. Love the brotherhood. Absolutely. It builds the Christian community. That means submitting to the needs of your brothers and sisters. Why do we do that? Because we fear God. We have reverence for him. That's why the community matter, matters. That's why the need of the people in the community matters. And then honor the king? Yes, if we have reverence for the Lord. Because ultimately the king is under God. And so we live well in society. This, this is what happens. It's funny to me. Here's what happens. When, when your team wins and whatever the thing is, local, statewide, federal, whatever it is. When your team wins, many times people say, it is ordained by God. <laughs> and then when your team doesn't win, then you say, oh, this is a travesty of just, God hates this. What? I mean, it's just everything. Every, you can get all the power you think you could possibly have. You are a pretender when it comes up against the power of God. The pretender. Okay, so preacher, smart aleck, what, what, what if they tell you you can't preach? And what are you going to do? What are you going to do if they tell you you can't preach? I'm going to preach. I'm not going to lay out on the road. I'm not going to ask you to go lay in the streets of Monroe and stop traffic. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm going to preach. And when they come to take me to jail, I'll go to jail peacefully. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Said he'd save me. <laughs> I love that guy. What did Peter do? Remember in the garden? In the garden when Jesus was being ready to take away? What did Jesus do? He just went with them. He didn't say, okay, here's our moment, guys. Let's fight. He didn't say, okay, guys, now everyone fall down. Make them drag you away. We have a lay-in in the garden. He went with them. What did Peter do? He drew a sword. Cut a man's ear off. Notice, though, the selection. The Roman cohort is there. He didn't attack them. The temple guard, they're there. Didn't attack them. The Pharisees didn't attack them. He attacked an, a servant of one of those people. Cut that guy's ear off. Jesus puts the ear back on and then rebukes Peter. What did he say to Peter? He said, Peter, if you're going to live by that sword, you're going to die by that sword. Here's what that means. You think you can kill somebody and get away with it? Not here you can't. You'll be taken in and killed yourself. And I'm not going to stop it. Because you're breaking a law by killing someone else and they'll kill you. If you think that's how you should act, Peter, you're going to die that way. In an ungodly way. Well, Peter learned a bit from that. Acts chapter 4, Peter stands up with John before a council that wants to put him in jail and here's what they say. If you talk about Jesus, you're going to go to jail. Peter said this in Acts chapter 4, 19 through 20, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. Look, you can send me to jail. And I'm not going to protest. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to cut anyone's ear off. You say I can go to jail for that, I'm going to go to jail for that. I will. I just can't stop speaking about Jesus. I can't. 
I can't. And if it becomes a law and I have to go, I'll go. I'll go. And he did. He went. He counted it as joy. The beatings that he took, he counted as joy. Couldn't believe that he had earned now the position that he could be abused for the cause of Christ. Acts chapter 12, where do we find Peter? Back in jail. And by the way, that time James, the brother of John, inner circle of Christ, had just been killed. And now they've got Peter. He's chained in jail to two guards, going to have to see Herod the next day. His death is coming soon. So what did the Christians do? Storm the jail? No. I mean, he's not, it's unjust, unjust why he's there. It's not right that he's there. They storm the jail? No. Protest? Tear stuff down? No. What'd they do? They prayed. Man, I wish Christians really believed in the power of prayer as much as they say they do. Amen, amen. They prayed. Guess what happened in the jail? Here's Peter. Here's Peter's sleeves chained to two guards. They hate him. They don't want to be there. And there they are, chained together. How you doing? Not so good. They go to sleep. Chains fall off. Door opens up. Peter walks out. And then he says, I love this. Maybe I should go to another town. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. By the way, after writing this, and he was, when he wrote this, he was under the rule of Nero, the, the maniac. He, 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 shortly after he wrote this, guess what happened to Peter? Guess what happened? Church history tells us what happened. He and his wife were taken in. They said, Peter, deny Christ or we'll kill her. There's his wife. They take his wife. Deny Christ. Deny Christ. Peter, you better deny Christ. And Peter looked at his wife and he said, remember the Lord. And he watched them kill her. Remember the Lord. This is what the governing authority is doing. God is still more powerful. They went to crucify Peter next. Peter said, I don't deserve to die the way Jesus died. Crucify me upside down. Deny Christ? No. I must see him. Submission out of reverence for God. When you give up your will for his will, that is growing up. For all of your anger and frustration about all these things you know and all these people you know on your team and all the issues you know, how well do you know what Jesus says? Give up of your will, take on his will. You're, I promise you, you're going to be a lot happier. Well, three of us are. I promise <laughs> you're going to be a lot happier. Stand with me. Let's close in a word of prayer. We're going to have a time of invitation. And in that, here's what happens. You, you can come forward if you want to come pray for anything, whatever it is. You can come. Someone will come up, a pastor, a deacon. They'll put their hand on your shoulder just to let you know you're not alone. We're in this together. We are in this together. We can get confused about things, frustrated about things, and, and, and all that. But ultimately, we're in this together under his authority, under his authority. So if you want to come and pray for whatever, maybe the Holy Spirit made it clear to you that today you, by faith, need to trust Christ. Because you've got all this anger in you frustration in you, indecision in you. You don't, know, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what to believe, who to believe. But maybe now, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit has come to you and in that, that still small voice way that he communicates, lets you know that here's your frustration and your problem. Here's the answer. The answer is Christ. So maybe, maybe today you're ready to surrender your will for his will and by faith trust him to be your Lord and Savior. Whatever it is, you... You respond now as God leads you. Father, we're thankful for the truth of your word. We are thankful for how convicting it is to us. God, we know this and, and we have discussed this. We pursue the things we love. And, and, and God, as, as, you, as your word tells us to examine ourselves, 
I wonder if now, God, you would help examine us. Are we, because the things we are pursuing, we love them. Are we pursuing you? Shouldn't we love you first? How are we pursuing you? So God, during this time of invitation, if there are those who need to come to pray about whatever, God, I pray that you would compel them to do that. Where they're in their seats, that they would sing with great energy and worship. And maybe there are those who are here today and say, look, I need Jesus. God, thank you for your grace that now by faith, they can call out to you, confessing with their mouth, believing in their heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I don't understand everything, but I know this, I need you. I've seen testimonies of people who've given their lives to you. And something in that and something in, in the preached word has now spoken to my heart. And Jesus, I, again, even though I don't understand everything, I need you. Would you come into my life? Would you change my life? Would you forgive me? Would you make me new? I need your help. I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong, but I am thankful for your promise that you can make me new. So Lord Jesus, would you do that? Would you save me? Father, as, as people examine themselves today before you and think through this reality of the human existence that what we really need is you, God, would you receive the glory for that that you deserve? And would you move us to give you that glory that you deserve? We'll give you the praise and honor and glory that's due only you as we pray to you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.